Okay, good morning. So today, uh, in my last lecture, we're finally going to get to alternatives. Uh, so I'm going to discuss what I think is at the moment uh, the best motivated uh, alternative to inflation. And this is the conformal mechanism. And there are many people who have worked on this. So I'll just list a few papers. Uh, there's a paper by Kraps, Hertog, and Turok. Oh seven twelve. And uh, then there's a series of very nice papers by Rubakov, starting in 2009. Then there's a paper on Galilean Genesis. And the culprits are in the audience, a subset thereof. And the, our contribution to this was to simply point out that, in fact, uh, the Genesis scenario and Rubikov scenario are in fact really uh, part of the same, are just different realization of the same idea. Uh, and so in a paper with Kurt, we, if you want, pointed out the similarities uh, of the approaches. Okay, so in a nutshell, what is the idea? Uh, so let me just write some words to, to give you the, the basic outline of the idea. So of course, being an alternative to inflation, there is no inflation in this scenario. And contrary to inflation, where of course inflation relies on a rapid expansion of space-time, so the dynamics of space-time is very important in generating scale invariant perturbations, here, on the other hand, gravity is completely unimportant. And we will see that, in fact, the dynamics, the space-time, instead of being approximately the sitter, which is the story for inflation, here it's approximately Minkowski. And the main reason why uh, I view this as a probably the best uh, alternative at the moment is that it relies on symmetries. Specifically, it relies on approximate conformal invariance in the early universe. And this is conformal invariance on uh, on Minkowski space-time, and so as a result, in three plus one dimensions, the conformal the group is the conformal group with uh, algebra SO4 comma two. And the reason we obtain scale invariant perturbations is that this uh, conformal group is spontaneously broken, as we will see. Some fields pick up a time-dependent profile in such a way that the conformal symmetries are spontaneously broken. And they're spontaneously broken, as we will see as follows, that the SO42 conformal group is spontaneously broken down to SO4, comma 1. Okay. And based on our discussion of the first lecture, we already know that SO4, comma 1 are the symmetries of the sitter. They're the symmetries of spectator fields and inflation. So already, our fluctuations will have the same properties as spectator fields and inflation, despite the fact that there's no the sitter. But moreover, they will be constrained by the, the symmetries that are spontaneously broken, the five symmetries that are spontaneously broken. Okay, so we'll see there are some very nice relations that we get at the end of the day. This scenario, I want to emphasize, uh, solves the flatness and horizon problem in a way akin to inflation, except with rather different dynamics. 
So once you turn on gravity, it's a mild evolution, but nevertheless, it drives the universe to be flat and homogeneous. That's the good news. The bad news, uh, compared to inflation, let's say, is that you need a bounce in this scenario or and or right, a violation of the null energy condition, okay? which is, in many ways, the uh, most robust of all the energy conditions in general relativity. Okay, so that's the price to pay. So that's the outline. So before we get to general generalities, I want to start with uh, a, a specific example just to fix our ideas. So the simplest examples Apologies to Paolo and Alberto. The simplest example is not Genesis. <laughs> it's uh, phi to the fourth. So let's just consider a scalar field in Minkowski space. So again, for the moment, we're completely ignoring gravity. So a scalar field in Minkowski space with a negative quartic potential. Okay, so of this type, but where lambda is negative. So the potential looks like this. Now, of course, the first pathology of this potential is that it's unbounded from below. Uh, but as we will see, we imagine uh, the genesis, the, the phase that we're going to be interested in doesn't rely on phi going all the way to minus infinity. At some point, the dynamics we'll describe will, uh, how to say, will break down. So it's natural to assume that this potential, or we have to assume that it's regulated somehow. And we imagine that this is coming from corrections of order which are suppressed by powers of M Planck. So for example, uh, six order over M Planck squared. And indeed, we will see that the dynamics we're interested in precisely breaks down at a point. It breaks down just in the sense that our approximations will break down, that nothing uh, really singular is going on, but precisely at a place where M one over M Planck corrections are important. So it's, you know, it's just an assumption that things are well behaved past this point. Now, a nice uh, curious feature uh, is that a, ne a negative quartic potential is actually uh, asymptotically free. If you work out the beta function, it's negative, so it's an asymptotically free theory. And moreover, at least classically, it is conformal. So it's classically conformal. Of course, quantum mechanically, there will be corrections that break conformal invariance, the famous Coleman-Weinberg corrections. Those will be kept small at the end of the day, so let's just think of it as a classically conformal uh, field theory. In other words, this theory is invariant under the following transformations. So this is the conformal group on full space-time. So it has, of course, the four space-time translations. These act on phi just simply with a gradient, as usual. You have the boosts the six boosts and rotations. So these are the Poincaré transformation, plus supplemented by dilation, space-time dilation. Sorry, this is a weight one field. And special conformal transformations on space-time, which act on phi as follows. So of course you recognize these, they're the same as the transformations we wrote down for the sitter, but now it's a, it's a conformal group on space-time, so the indices are Lorentz indices in this case. And to see that this is really the conformal algebra, in disguise, we can do an automorphism of the algebra. We can take linear combinations of these generators as follows. So let's define delta j five mu to be the linear combination of delta p mu 
plus delta k mu. Let us take delta, let's define j6 mu to be the difference of these two generators. And finally, I'll define J56 to be simply dilation. And you see, when you do this, that these 15 symmetries, they package themselves nicely into the following statement that the commutator of JAB, JCD is eta AC. Okay, where this eta is a six-dimensional metric, Minkowski metric with two times. So eta AB is by definition eta mu nu, one minus one. So it's a metric with two times. And this, of course, is just a good old uh, rotation group. So in this case, because of the signature, it describes SO4 comma two, okay? All right, so now we have this theory. It has these symmetries. And we shall consider a particular solution. At first, it would look, it's going to look like a fine tuned solution, but then we were to argue that, in fact, it's a dynamical attractor. So we're going to consider on this negative quartic potential a homogeneous solution, so similar to what we do in inflation. So we're going to assume a homogeneous background phi to be phi bar of t. Okay. Now, since I don't have gravity, uh, this theory is time translation invariant. So there's a conserved energy associated with it. So it's just the classical mechanics of a point particle rolling down this 1D potential. So there's a conserved energy a half phi dot squared plus lambda over four phi to the fourth. That's the first integral of motion that I get from the equation of motion. And so I can solve it easily for, I can solve this differential equation. We will be interested specifically in the solution that has zero energy. The zero energy solution. And I'm gonna argue in fact that this is an attractor. Okay, it looks like a very specific solution, but it's an attractor at the end of the day. And so the solution in this case, if I set E equal to zero, I can solve for phi dot in terms of phi, integrate, and the answer, so I should have put bars here, the answer for phi as a function of time is square root of two over minus lambda times one over minus t, where time here I'm taking to run from minus infinity to zero. So physically, what this describes is a, is a particle which in the infinite past started out at the top of the hill at t equals minus infinity and rolls down subsequently, okay? Again, it looks like a fine-tuned solution because it's precisely the initial conditions such, a, such that I start at the top asymptotically in the past, but uh, we will see that this is in fact uh, an attractor. For the moment, let's just take it as it is and study what this implies. Yes. Yeah, so somehow, um, that's right. So for ne negative lambda, a bit of function is positive, so you're driven to zero lambda. It's not relevant for what I'm talking about, it's just a curiosity. Hmm? No, I'm not using the, the asymptotic freedom in any way is a comment, a side comment. It's classically conformal because there is no mass scale in this problem. Hmm? 
Yeah. Ah, good. That's right. So this does not have a stable vacuum, obviously. Um, but for our purposes, uh, this will not be absolutely, so you're correct. For our purpose, this will not be uh, so important. At the end of the day, we're only going to be interested in the dynamics on the spontaneously broken solution, where conformal invariance is spontaneously broken. That's right. But what your comment is very relevant, in particular, um, because to get scale invariant perturbations, we will need a, a field which has weight zero, which would break unitarity explicitly. Uh, however, this weight zero field will turn out to be, if you want, in the simplest version, just an angular field. Okay, and so in fact it doesn't break unitarity because this weight zero field ceases to exist at the would-be conformal point. Yeah. So in fact, yeah, if you want, we never work around the point where conformal invariance is restored. We're always on the spontaneously broken solution. Okay, very good. So now let's indeed study the symmetries uh, that this preserves. So first of all, it's clear that uh, being just a time-dependent background, the symmetries that are preserved includes all the spatial stuff. So the symmetries that are preserved by this background are all the spatial uh, symmetries. So clearly spatial translations, spatial rotations, the uh, spatial part of the special conformal transformation, less obvious, uh, although somewhat obvious, is that this also preserves dilation. Because phi is a weight one field, and if I rescale time by a constant, uh, then indeed phi shifts in the appropriate, rescales in the appropriate way. So in fact, another symmetry that's preserved via this, uh, by this background is uh, space-time dilation. So how many symmetries are preserved? There are 10. So three Ps, three Ks, three Js, one D. OK, so there are 10 preserved symmetries. And therefore, five broken symmetries. So what is broken? What is broken is the rest. So clearly, this is a time-dependent background. So what's broken are, space, uh, are time translations, boosts, and the, the, time, the, the time part of the special conformal transformation. So these are the five symmetries that are spontaneously broken. So now let's study a little bit more uh, closely what these preserved symmetries are. So again, let us take uh, linear combinations of these guys. So let us take uh, the, the following linear combinations. So delta j 5i which is a half delta pi. So very similar to what we did over there. So delta pi plus delta ki. Then I'll define delta j 6i. No, somehow this is, I think this is wrong. This should be 4 and 5, I think. Well, let's leave it as 5 and 6 for the moment. OK. I'm just, I don't have a 4 index, basically delta pi minus delta ki. And finally, delta j56 will be simply the dilation. OK, so I'm just taking linear combinations of these unbroken guys. And you can check quite nicely that these, of course, obey a very similar algebra to what I wrote down earlier. So jab, jcd is basically that same commutation relation as earlier, plus dot, 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 dot. So basically exactly what I wrote down over there, where now uh, the metric eta that appears here, where eta AB is delta IJ 1 minus 1. So it's a five-dimensional Minkowski metric. And so this algebra, in fact, is just a rotation group, but with signature minus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. And so therefore, it is the SO4, 1 algebra. OK? So as advocated, this particular time-dependent background 
spontaneously break the original SO4, 2 down to SO4, 1. So these are the same, the unbroken symmetries are the same as the isometries of the sitter space. And so in particular, just based on what we discussed the very first lecture, this is the conformal group on R3. So we expect fields whose weight dimension, whose mass dimension, delta is much less than one, we expect those fields to have nearly scale invariant spectrum. scale-invariant spectrum. So indeed, let us uh, see that this expectation is borne out. Sorry, can you say again? The dilation is preserved. Where? Sorry. Sorry, where did I write nonlinear? <laughs> Sorry, guys, it's early in the morning. Oh, no, it's, it's uh, sorry. Thank you. OK, thanks. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because in my notes, phi was outside, yes. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's just a weight dimension one. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, because the theory clearly, the uh, quartic uh, linearly realized uh, dilation. OK, so indeed, as an example of such field, this is related to the question that was asked a few minutes ago. Let us consider, as a particular example, uh, let's consider a spectator field, which I'll call theta, whose weight dimension, whose mass dimension will be 0. Now. A general action at the quadratic level that I can write down for this guy, at least one term that will appear, let's just focus on that guy, will have the following operator. So I want to give this guy a kinetic term, d theta squared. But since theta has mass dimension 0, this has mass dimension 2 only. So I need two dimensions of mass out front. I cannot put an explicit mass scale because this would break in following invariance. So the only thing I can do, really, is to multiply this by phi squared. Let's put the minus a half here. OK. There are other things I can write down at the quadratic level, but for the kinetic term, this is what I can write down. OK. So in other words, by conformal invariance and the fact that this guy has weight 0, manifestly, it must be multiplied by phi squared. This also goes towards your point, obviously, because of course, in the conformal field theory, there are unitary bounds on the weight dimension. But you see that in the point where conformal invariance is restored, is phi equals 0, and this field ceases to make sense. So let us see. Uh, so now let us think about what happens to this field. The background solution for this guy is zero. Okay, so it doesn't do anything. So if I consider now quadratic fluctuations for this guy, you see that for at the quadratic order, what I should do is simply put the phi field on the background. Theta will be fluctuations, and now you see that this field exactly behaves as if it were coupled to an effective metric. It's as if it's coupled to an effective metric, g effective mu nu which is phi bar squared of t, eta mu nu. OK, it's identical. As far as it's concerned, it's as if it's coupling to a scale factor, which is phi. It doesn't tell the difference. Cannot tell the difference. And in particular, if you now plug in our solution for phi, this is equal to 2 over minus lambda, which is a positive thing, t squared, eta mu nu. And this you recognize as the conformal slicing of the sitter. So this field behaves exactly as a massless field on the sitter. This is the sitter metric. And so as a result, the two-point function for theta 
will be scale invariant. OK? All right. Now let's address uh, the fact that the solution we considered was rather special. Let's, let's consider the stability of the solution. Yeah, so you see it's very nice. In this scenario, the background metric is doing nothing. It's remaining Minkowski. But scale invariant perturbations are generated because there is a scalar field which evolves in time, and it acts effectively as a scale factor, pumping energy into other fields in the theory. OK, so for stability, let's consider perturbations around our time-dependent background, phi bar of t plus pi. Let's call pi the fluctuations. And it's a trivial exercise. You just perturb the action around our background, compute the equation of motion, and you find in the privacy of your room tonight that, in fact, this is the equation of motion for pi. And the fact that it has, um, the fact that you have this quartic potential, right, so there's a quartic potential, phi to the fourth. And so at quadratic order, I get phi squared on the background times pi squared. And this actually gives a tachyonic mass term, not surprisingly, because the potential is points downwards with the following with the following uh, term, so minus 6 over t squared. And now in the limit, uh, let's consider the limit of late time, or equivalently when, uh, so either when k goes to 0, or equivalently when t goes to 0. So at late times, we want to figure out what is the growing mode solution for this uh, perturbed equation. And it's easy. There are, two, there are two solutions. One is pi going as 1 over t squared. And the other is pi going as t cubed. But remember, t is going to 0. Okay, So in fact, the growing mode is this one. It's 1 over t squared. So this is the growing mode solution. And at first sight, this is alarming, because our background goes as 1 over t. The perturbation goes as 1 over t squared. So the perturbation seems to grow faster than the background, which seems to indicate an instability. But in fact, that's not so. If you think about it for a moment, you realize that if I take the background solution, phi, which we have over here, and imagine that I expanded it, I shifted time by a tiny amount epsilon. Okay, You see that I can, let's Taylor expand for small epsilon. This will give me phi bar of t uh, plus epsilon times phi bar dot of t. And phi bar dot will precisely go as 1 over t squared. Okay? So if you want, this term goes as 1 over t. That's our background. This guy would go as 1 over t squared. That's the growing mode fluctuations. So said, said differently, all that this is saying is that the perturbation, the growing mode of our fluctuation, resums to simply a time shift of the background. So in this sense, it's an attractor. If you perturb it, you wait long enough, and you find you get the same background solution, just time shifted by some amount. So the solution is an attractor in this sense. Are there questions so far? Yeah? Sorry, can you speak louder? I can't hear. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So the so at the end of the that's right. So let's compute. We'll compute that in a, in a in a little while. We'll see that the pi pi correlation function is actually very red by virtue of the fact that it has this tachyonic mass term. So we'll come back to that. That's an important issue in our story. Sorry, I can't. I can't hear. Can you? Can you? Can you scream? Ah, yes. So I just want to argue that. So why I introduce this delta this theta field? Yeah. 
So this theta field is just a field which uh, has, I'm presuming, is just a field in a theory, I'm presuming its existence, which has weight dimension zero. That's it. And then I argue that it has, in particular, it can have a kinetic term of this form. It must couple to phi, and as a result, must have a scaling variance spectrum at the end of the day. So the, the, the point is that I cannot write a sim simple kinetic term for this guy. It must, by controlling invariance, this kinetic term must be multiplied by phi squared. Okay. And so I, I guess I should, I should have said this, but obviously, in this interpretation, this is just a U1 it's to think of this quad, uh, inverse quartic potential with a U1 symmetry, and theta is just the angular variable for this potential. And that, that was Rubikov's model. You just have a theory with U1 global invariance, and that's it. There was another question, I think, uh, there. Shift symmetric, yes, exactly. That's right. So I could write down, I could also allow operators that would break the shift symmetry. So I could have also phi squared uh, uh, m, where m is a dimensionless, uh, sorry, hold on a second, oh, phi to the fourth, right, where this guy, let's call it kappa, is at a dimensionless number. So all that we have to assume in order for this to be uh, scaling invariant is that this kappa is sufficiently small. This will induce some tilt to the spectrum. But indeed, uh, one nice, one model you can consider is just when it's a U1 invariant potential, in which case this operator is absent. Okay. Where was I? Uh, I'm here. Okay, so now uh, we've seen this nice explicit example, and we can take a step back and describe the scenario in more general terms. This is what we did in the paper with Kurt that I mentioned earlier. So let's abstract ourselves from this particular example. So the general scenario and I would say this is why I think this scenario is, is, uh, is kind of interesting is that it's quite generic in some sense. So our postulate is that let's suppose that in the early universe you have an approximate conformal field theory and such that the dynamics of the CFT such that there will be uh, primary operators in the theory with weight delta i, so there could be more than one, such that these guys acquire some time-dependent VEV. So some time-dependent profiles. And the particular profile we're interested in is one in which these operators, O sub i of t, will be precisely proportional to 1 over t to the weight dimension of the corresponding operator. Right, so our scalar field was just a particular example of this where delta was 1. But in general, you can assume that, first of all, there are many such operators. And as long as all of these guys have time-dependent profiles which go as t to the particular weight, then if at least one of these fields, if at least one of the deltas is non-zero, okay, so that really there's time dependence in the story, then you can convince yourself rather easily that you get the same symmetry breaking pattern SO4, comma 2 goes to SO4, comma 1. And now you're done. You can just argue, first of all, based on just SO4, comma 1 invariance, like we did in the very first lecture, you can argue that the correlation functions must take on particular forms. So just based on SO4, comma 1 alone, So just based on, on SO4, comma 1, you can now deduce that the correlation functions of, let's say, perturbations of these O's, x1, x2, let's just take the two-point function, just like we did in the first lecture, this object must be, must scale as 
some coefficient divided by the distance x1 minus x2 to the delta i plus delta j if the deltas are the same. So these are just the rules of conformal, uh, conformal field theory on R3. So this is if, if the deltas are the same and it's zero otherwise. Similarly, the three-point function is also completely fixed up to a normalization. So the three-point function of three of these fields Cijk, x1 minus x2. So this is just the usual combination, x1 minus x3, delta i plus delta k minus delta j, x2 minus x3, delta j plus delta k minus delta i, and so on and so forth. Yes? I don't think so. No. So somehow at equal time, well, no, sorry, at unequal time, um, let me think about it for a moment. Yeah, I'm tempted to say at unequal times, the correlation function, so this SO4 1 must be the same as inflation. So you could probably say it's, it must be functions of the de Sitter invariant distance between the points. Yes. Because as far as these fields are concerned, it's like they're living on a de Sitter background. OK. So this, if you want, is the same story as what we discussed in the first lecture with respect to spectator fields and inflation. But now here we have more symmetries. We have the full SO4, 2. Five of those symmetries are spontaneously broken. And so associated with the five broken symmetries, namely the uh, time translations, the boosts, and the time component of the uh, special conformal transformation, there will be uh, soft pion theorems. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, one thing that's nice about this scenario is that uh, there are many different realizations. So there are many explicit realizations that people have thought about. So one of them is this part of the fourth example we talked about by Rubikov. Then there's Galilean genesis of Paolo and Alberto. There's, there are DBI generalizations of both these guys, okay? So, and presumably so on and so forth. In fact, you can possibly even contemplate generalizations of the scenario. So here we were interested in SO4, 2 down to SO4, 1. But really, from a group theoretic point of view, all we've used is that the fact that we have SO4, 1 as a subgroup as well as Minkowski space as another subgroup, okay, because that's the symmetry of the background, if you want. And one can argue that SO4, 2 is the smallest group that contains a subgroup to bore SO4, 1 and SO3, 1. But in principle, you can consider larger groups, okay? You could imagine some larger group on the left-hand side giving rise to SO4, 1 and Minkowski as subgroups. This is not, by the way, a violation of uh, Coleman Mandula, because in fact, uh, the symmetries we're considering are nonlinearly realized. So, in principle, there's a lot more freedom. Okay. Let me say a word about cosmology. So, so far, we've just been working in a static 
Minkowski background. So what happens when you turn on gravity? So there are many ways you can couple to gravity. The minimal way uh, is to simply couple minimally the CFT to gravity, which will, of course, break explicitly the conformal invariance of the theory. So we're going to assume uh, minimal coupling. So in other words, we envision the action simply begin, give, being given by Einstein-Hilbert gravity coupled to our CF, to, coupled to our CFT in this way. And like I said, the Einstein-Hilbert term, by, because it introduces, introduces M Planck, this explicitly breaks conformal invariance, but only very mildly. So it breaks conformal invariance mildly at the 1 over M Planck level. And indeed, we'll see that our, our results will be defined as a perturbative expansion in 1 over M Planck, with the zeroth order result being what we described up till now. So it's very nice that the cosmology, even the cosmology, can be described in a model-independent way, just based on the symmetries of the problem. So for any model that we would choose to consider. So first of all, at zeroth order in M Planck, so, so zeroth order in 1 over M Planck, so this guy to the zero, at this order, uh, we can write down immediately what the density of the CFT the energy density and the pressure will be given by. Okay. Now, by symmetry, both these guys must be purely time dependent. There cannot be explicit space dependence by homogeneity and isotropy. So there can only be functions of time. Moreover, by dilation invariance, they can only scale as their mass dimension, which is 4. So they must go as 1 over t to the fourth. So both of these quantities, both rho and p, must scale as 1 over t to the fourth, just based on dilation invariance. But moreover, at order, at zeroth order in M Planck, the energy density must be strictly conserved at this order in 1 over M Planck. So in fact, alpha must be 0. Does that make sense? Because energy density must be conserved if, in the absence of gravity. So this guy is 0, OK? At zeroth order in 1 over M Planck. So we fully fixed the uh, form of rho and p up to an arbitrary coefficient, and all the model dependence of the cosmology will sit in this particular coefficient. In particular, for the phi to the fourth example, beta is related to lambda in a simpler way, in a simple way. Very nice. So now we can go ahead and solve Einstein's equations in the presence of these sources. In particular, we can integrate the h dot equation to find out the expansion rate. So now we're moving away from the order 1 over m Planck. So to be precise, we're now moving to the 1 over m Planck squared order to discover what the cosmology is doing. So let's integrate the h dot equation, the h dot equation which reads 1 over 2 m Planck squared rho plus p. The right-hand side being down by 1 over m Planck squared, I can set the rho and p to be their zeroth order value. So this guy is 0, and p goes as 1 over t to the fourth. So this is minus beta over 2 m Planck squared t to the fourth. And so I can integrate, and I find that the Hubble parameter as a function of time is equal to beta over 6 m Planck squared t cubed. So the Hubble parameter in magnitude grows in time since t is going to 0. And now you'll notice that the sine of h is directly related to the sine of b, of beta. So t is negative. OK, so t is negative. So this is, the denominator is negative. And now depending on the sine of beta, you either get an expanding universe or a contracting universe. So specifically, for beta positive, the universe is contracting. And for negative beta, it's expanding. And of course, this is related to the null energy condition. 
uh, the uh, phi to the fourth example has a negative beta. You can show it's related to lambda directly, so it's negative, and so therefore you're contracting. Uh, sorry, sorry, I said this completely the other way around. So beta is positive for the, uh, for the uh, negative quartic potential, so you're contracting. In the genesis scenario, uh, you, consider, you can consider coefficients in such a way that you're in the expanding branch. The key point is that the evolution is very slow. If I integrate once more to get the scale factor as a function of time, you find the following. You just integrate this uh, order by order in 1 over m Planck. You find that the scale factor, the constant bit can be set to 1 without loss of generality. And then there's a time-dependent correction, which is of the form beta over 12 m Planck squared t squared plus high order corrections, dot, dot, dot. And so indeed, it's a Minkowski, for t large and negative, this is a small correction to Minkowski space. So we have a controlled expansion away from Minkowski, sorry, a, constro, a, a controlled perturbative expansion away from Minkowski space suppressed by 1 over m Planck squared. And just as a remark, such a slowly expanding or slowly contracting universe uh, corresponds to a large effective equation of state. So defining the equation of state as being proportional to minus h dot over h squared. I didn't bother to work out the coefficients. But anyways, minus h dot over h squared, the point is that this scales uh, as t squared and Planck squared over beta. Okay. So this is the key point. If beta is positive, namely you're contracting, so this is a contracting branch. then W, the equation of state for the CFT, is much bigger than 1 at early times. It diverges in the infinite past. And if beta is negative, corresponding to the expanding solution, then instead W is much less than minus 1. Does that make sense so far? OK, so this is the cosmology. You're either w is much bigger than 1 or much less than minus 1. These are the two branches. Yeah, so gay. Perfect. So that equation, turns out, is obeyed. Uh, so now, yes, exactly. But you see that at this order, very good. It better be obeyed, because we know that the Freeman equation, the h dot equation, and the energy conservation equation, they're redundant. There's one that's redundant. So if you want Freeman equation, it's the first integral of motion of the other two. But uh, you can see that explicitly. So if I try to, at this step, write down immediately the Freeman equation, which would be rho over m Planck squared. I find nothing at this order, because rho was 0 at 0 third and m Planck. So the, it's the, the right-hand side is 0 to order 1 over m Planck squared. Similarly, the left-hand side, based on what we found, is also 0, because it goes as 1 over m Planck to the fourth. So to really fish out the appropriate correction, what you have to do is you have to correctly find the leading correction to rho. Okay? And you can do that by solving the conservation equation. Plugging what h is, solve for rho, and so on and so forth. You find the correction to rho, and you can check order by order the Freeman equation is satisfied. Now, I want to argue that this such a background. Uh, so remember, let's, let's think about the logic of what we said. So I gave a specific example at the beginning with this phi to the fourth. I showed, uh, we started with a particular time-dependent solution. We showed that this was stable under perturbation of the scalar field itself. But now you, wanna wonder, you wonder, now that we've introduced gravity, does gravity mess everything up? Is the universe going to become inhomogeneous uh, due to gravity? Okay? And I want to argue that that's not the case. In other words, the solution is stable even taking into account gravity. And the argument uh, for this purpose, all I'm going to do is a 
heuristic uh, argument, which is the following. So let's consider in general, this is a general argument, if you want, that uh, let's consider a very general Freeman equation of the following form. So I'm going to allow all kinds of form of stress energy on the right-hand side. So in particular, let's allow for a non-relativistic dust component, a relativistic radiation component, a spatial curvature term. I also can allow for the kinetic energy of a scalar field. Let's call that C kinetic, which would go as A to the 6, plus dot, 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 dot. And we also allow ourselves a component, which is an additional component. In this case, it would be the CFT component. Let's just call it C sub phi. Uh, in for to be generic. And this C sub phi will, be, will have some generic equation of state, which I'll take to be constant, to be W sub phi, okay? So W sub phi is the equation of state of this postulated component, and I'm taking it to be constant, so that the energy density component goes as precisely this particular power. So this is more general. I, I, this is an argument that's separate from what we've said so far. It's more general, if you want, than our particular considerations. And now we want to ask, uh, under what circumstances um, are, do we solve the flatness problem? So what I mean by the flatness problem, uh, people even now disagree on exactly what, what is meant by it. What I mean by the flatness problem is quite simple. I want to consider initial, an initial time of my evolution in which uh, these components on the right-hand side, they all make comparable contributions to the Freeman equation. Okay? So I want to think in particular of the curvature being roughly comparable to the Hubble radius at this initial time. It cannot be exactly of the same order. It may be a little bit subdominant to start the evolution, but in any case, I'm not fine-tuning it. And now I want to ask what happens subsequently. So if the universe is expanding, the scale factor is growing, then clearly under the standard set of components, since A is expanding, the, the term on the right-hand side, which dominates, ultimately, will be the spatial curvature. And that's the flatness problem. An expanding FRW universe tends to become dominated by curvature at late times. So if you want to avoid domination by curvature, what you must ensure is you have to throw in a new component whose power of A must be less than 2, so that it dominates over the curvature component as the universe expands. So in other words, what we need is 3, 1 plus W sub phi, to be uh, less than 2, and this implies that w must be less than minus a third, okay? So that immediately leads you to inflation, or accelerated expansion, because w is minus a third is exactly the threshold between, between deceleration and acceleration. So this is inflation. Right, so in fact, there are two branches, if you want. One of them is that W lies between minus one and minus a third, and that's the usual, what's usually assumed for inflation. And our solution over there, this genesis type solution, in fact corresponds to W being less or much less than minus one. Okay, so this, this is if you want the genesis branch. In particular, in the limit that W becomes much less than one, it corresponds to very slow expansion Okay, but nevertheless, what, what it means is very slow expansion. W must be much larger than, much less than minus one, and so this guy actually grows like tremendously fast as A, as A grows, while the other components are remaining pretty much constant. Does that make sense? In a contracting universe, on the other hand, if the universe is contracting, then instead the scale factor is shrinking to zero. So if you're contracting, then instead the scale factor is going to zero. And so now the dangerous comp contribution is the one that blue shifts the fastest, namely this contribution, kinetic energy of a scalar field or anisotropy of the collapse. Uh, so you have to worry about, these, about, these, about this term. And so in this case, if you want to win over, over the 1 over 8 to the 6 contribution, W must be bigger than 1. Okay, so the other possibility here is that W sub phi be bigger than 1. And that is our other branch. Of course, I've conveniently erased it, but here I had W somewhere being bigger than 1 in our case. So this would be the contracting branch of the conformal scenario. 
Now, in either case, you see that, again, assuming these contributions are roughly comparable at the initial time, as time goes on, you're completely dominated by the CFT contribution, or the inflationary contribution in the standard story. And so you see that the universe is driven to be flat, homogeneous, and empty. All these other sources are driven to zero. So in fact, the solution we've been discussing is a dynamical attractor, even in the presence of gravity. Now, of course, the key difference with inflation, as people as some people would say, is that, of course, here, by virtue of the fact that you're slowly evolving in time, the patch of the universe you start with has to be already pretty large. Okay, so it's not gut scale. It's something much larger, like millimeter or so. So when I say these contributions have to be comparable, I'm assuming that the curvature scale of the universe is millimeter size to start with, not gut scale. So some people would say, well, inflation is better on that count. Whatever, okay, so the version of the flatness problem that I'm considering is simply the statement that all these components are comparable. Okay, very nice. Yes, Merdad? That's right. So uh, what we're saying is, so now in the presence of gravity, the universe will have some, it will be in general an FRW metric, which can have different amount of curvature. Physically, as usual, this, this would correspond to the local patch you're considering. Physically, it would correspond to local patch being either slightly underdense or overdense compared to the rest of the matter. But the point is that as time goes on, that, that curvature becomes irrelevant. The question in the back, yeah? Yeah, so that's a matter of, uh, that's a matter of taste at some level. Uh, yeah, in fact, this may be what, what I'll discuss later today. These issues of fine-tuning, they're very difficult to make quantify, to quantify them. Uh, of course, uh, if you start at the with a universe that starts very hot at the Planck scale, okay, or gut scale. Now, if the universe is very hot, then clearly you shouldn't assume that it's already very homogeneous to start with. Because they're, you know, being at hot temperature means there are many states that are nearly degenerate, so why choose a particular state? If your philosophy is instead that the universe starts out very cold, as is the case here, you imagine that you start with a slow evolution, then who knows, maybe it's much more, at least philosophically, if the universe starts out cold, then it, it's reasonable to assume there is a preferred state to start with. That was always the philosophy in these alternatives. Yeah. Yeah. The matter density. Omega. Yeah, omega. Uh, yeah, the point is that uh, omega, by definition, is always one if I include curvature. Okay? Now, if you throw in curvature, it can be less than one. Blah, blah, blah. So the assumption, it's like inflation, right? At the beginning of inflation, omega, let, let's, let's ignore curvature. Omega can be bigger than one or less than one. But you cannot have arbitrarily a large amount of, in, of curvature, otherwise inflation doesn't start. Okay, so it's the same story here. You can tolerate some amount of curvature, like I said, order one, but usually a bit below one. But the point is that as the universe evolves, omega is driven to zero. Sorry, to one, excuse me. Curvature is driven to zero, so omega goes to one. Yeah. Very nice question. So there is a scale now, which is M Planck. So the symmetry is being broken by M Planck. Okay. Uh, other than that, yeah, so there, there is a, uh, yeah, if you want, other, other than that, the symmetries are broken by initial conditions. So if you take our Friday the 4th example, we precisely chose, a, so there, there, there's another solution in that example, which was you stay at the top of the hill, perched, and then the conformal invariance is forever, forever there. Okay, classically. Uh, but we chose a solution in which you roll. So that's it. 
That's how we break the symmetries. And that introduces a scale. In a sense, it introduces 1 over t. OK. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice question. That's right. That's right. So very nice question. So in fact, as you know, in a collapsing universe, uh, you, can inv you can get into a regime where you, you enter a chaotic billiard regime in which some dimensions will shrink, other will grow in, in a way that's chaotic. Uh, that's precisely what's avoided here, if you want. So the, uh, this onset of chaotic uh, behavior is triggered by the fact that this term, which also comes from so this is the average anisotropy, if you want. The, the contribution to the average scale factor is a 1 over a to the 6 contribution. And indeed, if I don't have this component, it's driven to dominate everything else. And once it's dominating, it's the onset of this mixed master behavior. But that's precisely the point. It's somewhat counterintuitive. But if I had this additional component with w bigger than 1, in fact, the mixed master behavior is squenched, OK? Because this guy comes to dominate. If you want, one way to think about it is the scale factor doesn't change very much. The expansion is very, the contraction is very slow. But this is boosted by a huge power. Okay. So the other guys stay roughly constant. OK, let's, uh, let me uh, move on. Yeah, I want to come back to a question that was asked earlier uh, about the fluctuations of pi. Because this will play a role in what we're about to about the observational consequences of the story. OK, so let's move on to observational consequences. And, uh, and in fact, so these, so many of these, in fact, all of the observational consequences I'm going to discuss were basically derived by Rubikov and collaborators in a series of papers. And then our contribution with Paolo and Marco and my former student, Austin Joyce, was in fact to show uh, that these observational consequences are purely the result of symmetries, whereas Rubikov was deriving them in his phi to the fourth model, we showed that they're really a consequence of symmetries. So first of all, uh, indeed, coming back to the question that was asked, let's consider this spectrum for pi. OK, so we've already understood the growing mode. So just to recap, right, this was the mode function equation for pi with the famous tachyonic term. By the way, pi, of course, here is really the goldstone for the spontaneous breaking pattern. Okay? It's really the goldstone for SO4,2 going to SO4,1. And at first sight, it's puzzling the fact that pi has a mass, okay? a tachyonic mass, moreover. Given that it's a goldstone, it should be massless. But again, this is an artifact of being uh, a space the, the, the symmetries are space-time symmetries, the ones that are spontaneously broken. In fact, the generalization of a goldstone mode in this case is just a statement that in the long wavelength limit, this mode just becomes a redefinition of the background, which indeed this is what it is. It just becomes a time shift. So uh, we remember that the growing mode solution at long wavelength was 1 over t squared. And so without doing calculation, we could just solve this guy, yada, yada, yada. But it's, it's simple, just based on dimensional analysis. This is a massless, is it, it's, dimension, uh, dimension, uh, it's a massless field. And so as a, as a result, just based on dimensionality, the power spectrum for pi must precisely scale as 1 over k squared, t squared. OK? Now, as a result, the spectrum is very red. which is just a statement that pi grows as t goes to 0. So correspondingly, in the infrared, it's very large. Nevertheless, this is not, uh, this is not a, um, how to say, disaster for observations. Because if you actually compute 
uh, a final observable, in particular the curvature perturbation, you find that the curvature spectrum, the curvature perturbation spectrum is actually very blue. So it scales as k cubed, or k squared, I think. OK? So it's a very blue spectrum for the curvature perturbation. And what it means is that simply uh, the spectrum, the curvature perturbation that's due to pi, so this is due to pi, is very small at long wavelength. OK? So in fact, it's, uh, from that point of view, this guy is unobservable. It also means, therefore, that pi is not the source of the density perturbation we observe in the Lake universe. The source of it must be the spectator field theta, which must convert to zeta uh, somehow later on in the process, okay, through some conversion mechanism like curvaton or modulated reheating, something or other that will generate, that will transfer the scaling variance spectrum of theta onto zeta. Nonetheless, the fact that pi has a red spectrum has observational consequences. So this is what I want to discuss next in the last part of the lecture. So pi is the goldstone for, uh, for the uh, symmetries, the, the, the broken symmetries. And so the broken symmetries, remember, are time translations, boost, and the time part of the special conformal transformations. You can easily work out, uh, based on the field transformations, that pi under these transformations shift as, shifts as follows. So delta pi is 1 over t minus dt pi under boosts. It's xi over t And finally, under the time part of the special conformal transformation, it goes as x squared, sorry, with a minus, OK, so coming to Diana's question earlier, so now it's not a typo. OK, so these three transformations you see are manifestly nonlinear on pi. So pi really is the goldstone for these transformations. And based on our discussion in the last lecture, we therefore expect that pi will be associated with soft pi on theorems. Namely, insertions of soft pi's will be related to symmetry transformations on the lower order point function, exactly like we saw last time. So I'm going to move on to slides at this point. Oops. Okay, so this is the story. These are the soft pions for, uh, for, for pi. So just like we did yesterday, we imagine taking the soft limit of a pi insertion times an operator O that involves a bunch of Ks, one through N. And now you immediately intuit that in momentum space, you see, you can al already guess the answer. Because first of all, it all involves 1 over T. Okay, so time dependence is explicitly involved. So you expect that the transformation on the soft, on the hard modes will, be, will involve time derivatives of the hard modes. That's number one. And number two, you see that you have different powers of x's, so constant, linear, and quadratic. So in momentum space, you expect, just like we discussed yesterday, a constant shift, a piece linear in Q, and a piece quadratic in Q. And that's, what, that's what's found. Okay? There's a minor subtlety, which I'm going to gloss over, which is the fact that the Q squared bit is actually not the full Q squared, but it's a Q squared that's averaged over all the angles of Q. Okay? But aside from that, this is the answer, okay, which we worked out. Now, it's very nice because you would say, well, on the one hand, there are more relationships than in, scalar field, uh, in, in, in spectator field inflation. There are all these new soft limits which we can test. Unfortunately, pi is not itself directly observable. As we saw, pi doesn't contribute to zeta at the end of the day. 
Uh, so how, do you, how can you test this? What it means is that there are still some tests you can do, but the, the, the test will be more model dependent, so to speak, a bit less direct. So let's discuss a, a few of them. Yeah, so, and, and these crucially rely on the power spectrum for pi being very red, as we saw. Okay, so here's one, uh, one particular uh, example. So if you take, uh, so pi does participate through correlation functions of spectators through exchange diagrams. So it can be in an eternal leg, okay, contributing a four-point function, for example, for the spectator field. Now, in the limit that this, this mode in between becomes very soft, namely when the hard guys are basically collinear, so that they add up to almost zero momentum, in that limit, you basically have the same phenomenon as in field theory, where you have Kutkowski rules. So the diagram factorizes. So in this particular limit, as Q goes to zero, the diagram factorizes into the product of two three-point functions with a soft pi inserted in each. So at the end of the day, uh, given that pi uh, acts non trivially in the correlation functions, you find a particular shape for uh, this four-point function. You see, number one, the angular dependence is peculiar. Okay, it's a particular angular dependence, which in fact vanishes when integrated over. And secondly, I keep clicking because I'm used to, but no. And, and moreover, you see that the Q dependence is one over Q. So this four-point function becomes very large, in fact, in this collinear limit. Okay, so that's one signature. Uh, the shape is special, and also the amplitude is quite large as Q goes to zero. There's also some contributions from pi coming from loop diagrams, such as this one. And you can show this gives a usual tau and L shape for the experts, a usual shape of a four-point function, which has a particular uh, Q dependence. Um, and finally, even if pi is not itself observable, it does affect, so if you want, if you imagine the global profile for pi, locally, the local value of pi will affect the local observables, in particular, the uh, theta theta correlator. Here I'm calling it chi, but really chi is the same as theta. So the local, in any given realization, the local value of this of pi will affect the local statistics of our correlation functions. Uh, and so, in particular, you find the following: so the two-point functions of of theta, okay, or chi, in the presence of a long wavelength pi acquires, by virtue of the coupling to pi, it acquires some particular anisotropic contributions. Okay, so the power spectrum will have, at some level, anisotropies, uh, which are quadrupolar, in fact. So cosine theta is the angle between the hard mode k and q, okay? And moreover, so you see there's some, uh, sh there's some scale dependence. This piece is scale invariant, and the other uh, is actually dying off uh, on small scales. Okay, so these are things that, in principle, one, uh, one can look for in the data. And again, our contribution with Paolo and Marco was simply to point out that these features are all governed by symmetries, okay? So at the end of the day, if you were to see these signals, uh, it would be a, a strong indicator of this conformal mechanism. Now, you could ask, could I do this in inflation? You know, can I just have these features in inflation? The answer is yes, you can do anything you want in inflation. You could cook up a pi, which couples in precisely the right way, so it has this particular spectrum, and it couples to another field precisely in the right way, and do, you can do anything you want in inflation. But it would be very unnatural in some sense. It would, nothing would force you to do that, whereas here, really, the, exist, the very existence of pi is forced upon you based on the symmetry breaking pattern, the fact that it's a goldstone. Okay? So that's all uh, I had to say about uh, the conformal mechanism, I think. So there's some, ah, and finally, of course, the very last thing I want to say are gravity waves, which you've heard about yesterday's, in yesterday's colloquium. Gravity waves are really uh, very hard to generate in anything other than uh, inflation. And the simple fact, the reason is that, so here, the reason we were generating scale invariant perturbations for the scalar fields was because in the CFT, fields had some time-dependent value, they were coupling, yada, yada, yada. The point, though, is that gravity waves only care about gravity directly, the gravitational background. In this case, the gravitational background is very slowly evolving. It's very close to Minkowski space. And so naturally, gravity, gravity waves are not appreciably excited. So had the bicep brouhaha been really confirmed, this would have ruled out these kinds of alternatives, okay? But 
It was more brouhaha than anything else, and so therefore, jury is still out. Okay, so that's all I had to say about uh, the conformal, conformal story. Let me pause for questions. Yes, Sergey. Very good, very good question. So, that's right, that's a great question. So, first of all, uh, so R is zero, okay. Uh, NS, uh, NS is anything you want uh, in the sense that, um, you know, NS at the end of the day, so let's go, let's go back to our theta field. So when I wrote down the action for theta, I had that it was phi squared d theta squared that gave rise to an exactly scale invariant spectrum. But now you can have corrections, as discussed. I could have phi to the fourth theta squared. So this will give rise to an effective mass term for theta once phi picks up an expectation value. And so depending on the magnitude of kappa, this is still conformally invariant classically. Now, depending on the magnitude of kappa, this will induce a small tilt red or blue, depending. So there's no preference for blue or red from this point of view. Uh, of course, this is a multi-field scenario, so naturally you expect uh, significant non-Gaussianities. So the fact that theta could have non-vanishing three-point or four-point function, that when you convert to zeta, this will give rise to some local FNL for zeta. And so, again, this is very model dependent. However, uh, uh, the fact that you haven't observed FNL personally doesn't necessarily rule this out because the three-point function, there could be a symmetry that protects this three-point function from being non-zero. And indeed, in the model of Rubikov, this three-point function vanishes. Now, there will be FNL generated from the conversion. It's a nonlinear conversion process, uh, but these can be small, okay? These can be order one. Uh, so... But like any multi-field scenario, if you keep on measuring higher point function, constraining tau and L and so forth, at some point, uh, yeah, at some point it, it becomes unnatural not to have significant non-Gaussianities in these models. Yes, Hassan. Very good. Yeah, very good. So uh, people have studied this. In fact, uh, Franz Pretorius in Princeton, together with Paul Steinhardt and a couple of other uh, collaborators, they actually did the numerical simulations to see what happens when you consider you know, more general initial conditions for the scalar field. So I think they considered simply, uh, they only considered the scalar field coupled to gravity, so no other fields in the story, but now with generic initial conditions. And you see the attractor mechanism taking place, namely, regions where the scalar field were, was sufficiently homogeneous, those regions evolve very slowly. Regions where the scalar field was more anisotropic or things were wilder, they collapse into a big crunch singularity. So you see, the only difference with inflation is inflation generates a lot of space in the process, a lot of space time. In this case, all that happens is you start with a patch and that batch keeps on its initial size, so to speak. But relative to the rest, it wins in volume as you wait long enough. So what I said, which is a perturbative argument, is borne out by these non-perturbative numerical calculations. So how typical is this one space You want to put a measure? Yeah, that's right. So at the end of the day, absolutely, it's a valid point. At the end of the day, it becomes a similar constraint as an in inflation. So inflation? Yeah. Suppose you don't have any gauge with any source and hydrostatic then these are the really one less and one equal all these factors. No, it depends how much you start with. So, so uh, no, I agree with you, but uh, no, but I, I'm saying, I, I think the statement I'm making is simply that in order at the end, to, to, for the end of inflation, by the end of inflation, to have a universe that's sufficiently flat to correspond to observations today, you need to have a certain number of refolds, as you well know. It's a similar story here. So your initial conditions must be such that you have a sufficient number of 
e-folds of contraction, but now the e-fold, since the universe is not evolving very uh, rapidly, then the time scale is set by the scalar. So phi goes as one over t. So you should ensure that this evolution is preserved for a range of time, uh, which is very similar. You, you get a number of e-folds just like in inflation. The only difference, like I said, I, and I'm not selling you a used car, I'm being very honest, that uh, at the end of the day, the, the difference with inflation is you start with a large patch as opposed to a microscopic patch. Yes? Yeah, there are no ghosts, so that's right. So those theorems, uh, it's very interesting. So in general, there's a, 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 it's a very deep question as to uh, whether, um, that's right, so what is it that you violate? What sacred principle do you violate if you violate the null energy condition? So first, indeed, people thought, well, you have a ghost, it's not a, but then people found example, ghost condensate, the Galileon, in which you can violate the neck without having ghosts, but then you have other problems associated with it. So for ghost condensate, there is no Lorentz invariant vacuum associated with it. You're always working in the spontaneously broken phase. In the, in the Galileon case, uh, you have superluminal perturbation. So it's a long story. But it's an interesting question. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, let me see. So at the end of the day, I think, uh, the, so one example that we cooked up, so there, it's a whole history of, refinements, if you want, so pushing, trying to push the limit as to what of these principles, so what of these pathologies are really fundamental and which can be avoided, and uh, in one of our, in one of the papers, so I think there was a paper by Rubikov, and there was one by us, in fact, by, um, what's his name, um, uh, by David, uh, yeah, the, yeah, exactly, so, so David and also, uh, and, and, and other people, and Enrico, in fact, in Kaini. So you can find, and now you can find uh, uh, solutions, that vi theories in which you violate the neck, in which you start from a theory that has a well-defined Lorentz invariant vacuum. You move on uh, continuously to a solution that violates the null energy condition without developing ghosts or gradient instabilities in the, in the process. The theory around the neck violating solution is subluminal. The only leftover pathology is that the theory around Minkowski is uh, superluminal, if I remember correctly. Okay, so at the end of the day, there's, uh, but that's the furthest that we've taken it or that people have taken it as far as I know. But it's a very interesting question, right? What is it that fundamentally do you uh, violate, if you want? Yes? Uh, yeah, but the patch is not, um, how to say, the initial patch is not uh, 10 to the 28 centimeters, it's a millimeter, okay? So you solve it just by saying, uh, in the same way that inflation solves it, all that inflation says is that you start inflation in a Hubble radius. Within that Hubble radius, you, by causality, things have had time to communicate and homogenize themselves to some extent, and then inflation takes on. Here it's the same, except that the initial patch is a millimeter. That's the difference. But otherwise, you just say, I start homogeneous within that patch. I let things evolve. The point is that the contraction is completely asymmetric with respect to the expansion subsequent to the hot Big Bang. So a millimeter turns into a large universe, ultimately. Yes? Yeah, that's right. So we, uh, yeah, we were never probably very precise about reheating, but I guess it's quite model dependent. So first of all, if you're contracting, you have to bounce, and then you want to reheat after the bounce, not before, because if you reheat before, you'll go into a big crunch. Okay, but it's quite model dependent. I don't know. In, gen it's, in Genesis, I guess you hit strong coupling, so you can say maybe this is where you reheat. And, Ah, that's a good question, right. That's a good question. So uh, the answer is yes. So if you, you have to convert to zeta, if you convert to zeta uh, before, you convert to zeta, and now, uh, uh, so in the models that, that, that we've studied in which you have a non-singular bounce, for example, with a ghost condensate or as a toy model to get a smooth evolution, 
you find that zeta uh, on scales much larger than the Hubble scale at the bounds is constant, is preserved. So the spectrum of zeta uh, is preserved through the bounds. The what for granted? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But that's, that's a much better assumption than in inflation, if you think about it. So Bunch-Davies vacuum here, we're starting cold, OK? Now, I don't believe in transplanking story, but all the modes that we're talking about that end up forming galaxies in the late universe, they're all macroscopic, OK? So assuming you, the universe starts out cold, assuming that these modes are in their ground state is perfectly reasonable. In inflation, inflation, I mean, the, of course, the story starts hot, hot. So, I mean, there I also think it's reasonable, but for different reasons. I mean, it's a, okay. Yes. There is no what? There is no gravitational waves. No, no, no blue shine, right? No what? No Gaussianities. No yeah, but Planck, I mean, Planck doesn't go down. I mean, it's what, F and L of 2 plus minus something, right? Or what is it, 5 plus minus 2? So, for example, in Matthias's modulated reheating, yeah, it's too bad that Planck really didn't go further down. Because if you had gone down to F and L of 1, even, that would have been great. So for example, in modulated reheating, you get F and L of three. You can get F and L of three, so, yeah. No, I mean, it's a, it non, it's a multi-field scenario, so you do get non-Gaussianities, but no, the real motivation is to try to, to have an alternative to inflation, right? Now, speaking of which, I can tell you in two minutes my alternative, is that okay? So. <laughs> My favorite alternative is abracadabra uh, string theory, abracadabra. <laughs> and I'm absolutely serious, okay? This is, this is being recorded. I'll find I'm fired from Penn tomorrow and then because it's been posted on Twitter or something. But uh, I'm absolutely serious, okay? So I'll tell you uh, for what it's worth. I really think now this is the best alternative uh, for the following reason. So in a nutshell, right? What inflation does is it does the following. So first of all, you don't know the initial state at the onset of inflation. That's also abracadabra. And it's abracadabra in such a way that this, uh, some scalar field in our past history started out perched on top of its potential. Okay. And then you have some evolution. And beautifully enough, this generates scale invariant perturbation. And this is the beginning of the hot big bang phase. And then everything follows. So my alternative is abracadabra, OK? So you just start from a question mark, and you go straight to a scale invariant spectrum on super horizon scale, a flat universe, and all that. Now, this, you'll say, has many undesirable features. Number one, it's not falsifiable, OK? So good. But this is like Matthias's story. If you find an observation tomorrow, I'll just learn something about the initial state. So you learn that there's gravity waves. Perfect. I'll put in gravity waves in my initial state. You find there's non-Gaussianity, I'll put in non-Gaussianities in my initial state. Perfect. It's not falsifiable. We say, ah, oh, but inflation is falsifiable. Is it? So if it, inflation is the same story, you find a new observable that contradicted your favorite inflaton potential, you change it. You find a new inflaton potential. In fact, I'm hard pressed if anybody could tell me one observable that would falsify inflation. I've never heard one, OK? Because every, every time there's something that comes up, people change their story, OK? There's tension between Planck and bicep. No problem. We'll put some running and fit the data, OK? So it's just equally unfalsifiable as inflation is, OK? It's just I'm putting everything here. But now you're going to say, OK, that's nice. Uh, but I like inflation better because from arbitrary or for some arbitrary initial conditions, I can get a universe like I see, whereas here you're putting it by hand, right? There's no quantified way that I know of that makes inflation favored over what I just said. And this is an old argument. It goes back to Penrose. And in fact, there's a very nice paper by Holland and Wald, Holland and Wald from 2002. And I remember reading it as a grad student, and I thought, these guys are kooky. Okay? It didn't make any sense. 
And now I'm older, I read it again, and I think these guys were geniuses, okay? This makes absolute sense what they're talking about. So the point is the following. Of course, it, it's the famous arrow of time problem that if you say, uh, you want to say that there's some, you start from some chaotic arbitrary initial conditions and inflation will take over because it's an attractor and you'll be led dynamically very often to this state. If you assume, ignoring weak interactions, that the physics is time reversal invariant, and the measure, uh, the, 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 uh, yeah, so the measure you put uh, is also, uh, on the evolution, is also time reversal invariant, then by Liouville's theorem, the measure on final states is the same as the measure on the initial states. Again, it's nothing new, what I'm saying. But what this means is it's the following. So you have a beautiful story for inflation, which is you start from a patch, a small patch, which was somehow, you know, fluctuating, chaotic a little bit. Inflation takes over, and out of this produces a beautiful big universe, which at late times has these beautiful galaxies and all kinds of complicated physics from a rather simple initial condition. But if physics is time reversal invariant, it means that there is a perfectly fine solution, fine solution to the equation of motion, which is that you start from our messy universe with galaxies and baryons and all the stuff that Matthias was talking about. You co start collapsing this universe, and you see what happens. Now, if you play that movie in your mind, you'll see that more often than not, of course, you collapse to a crunch. Things become very, very chaotic, very messy as you collapse this universe. Instead, the, the movie I'm proposing to you is that all these messy galaxies and so forth, they collapse together, they form a pristine cosmic microwave background, which is homogeneous at one part in 10 to the 5. And moreover, all this radiation, this entropy that sits there, further collapses and coalesces to a microscopic patch in which a single degree of freedom comes back and rolls up the potential, okay? So this movie played forward in time is absolutely nonsensical. And you would say it, has, it must have tiny probability of, being, of occurring. Now, if the, if the laws of physics and the measure you put on initial and final states are the same by time reversal invariance, then it tells you that equally well, this story of inflation being a natural, um, that, that, that starting from inflation is a natural initial state must be very unlikely. Okay, again, it's nothing new. People have pointed this out for a long time. But somehow, as far as I know, never, people never pushed it to its logical conclusion, which is if that's true, then it means that we might as well just postulate the initial state to be what we observe it to be. And the point is more than philosophical. In cosmology, unlike anything else in science, we don't get to choose initial conditions. Usually in physics, you want to learn something about dynamics, you pl play with initial conditions. You change them, and then you see what happens as a function of initial conditions, and you, you determine the dynamics. Here, all we have is things at the present time, and we're trying to deduce what happened dynamically based on some postulate for the initial state, for the initial conditions. You cannot disentangle the two. So at some level, without a theory of initial conditions, how can I believe that inflation was more favorable over what I just postulated as my alternative? So that's... I believe in dinosaurs. Very good. So, of course, we believe that things happened in the past. Okay? We believe in the past. That's, of course, the story. Uh, and I know you know this, but for the, purpose, for the benefit of the, of the students... Uh, because this is not something that was obvious to me, is that, of course, this is all tied to the second law of thermodynamics. And so you have to be careful how you use it because of the following reason. You walk into your favorite bar, OK? And at the bar sits your drink, your favorite drink. And in it sits a half-melted ice cube, because the bartender knows you. He puts it there already before you step in, OK? And now you say, let me, based on my statistical physics book, predict what will happen to the ice cube, to my drink. And of course, you say, well, entropy is going to increase. So here's the entropy of my system as a function of time. And the ice cube will met, melt, and entropy will grow, and so forth. And now I ask you, predict for me, based on the same principle, what happened five minutes before you stepped into the bar. And you say, oh, of course, well, the bartender put it in my glass with a, uh, with a full ice cube. And so the entropy of the system was even lower. Well, that's wrong. That's not what your physics textbook would tell you. Because if physics is time reversal invariant, what led you to think that entropy would rise in the future would also tell you that the entropy will rise in the past. So in fact, that the half-melted ice cube should have been a full ice cube to start. Sorry, if it should have been water that spontaneously formed a half-melted ice cube. That's what you'll deduce. So indeed, right? Of course, that's.
Of course, of course, of course, that's right. So ultimately, we are forced to postulate a past hypothesis. We postulate that there was a low ent entropy initial state. Yeah, yeah. You coarse grain, yeah. yes. <laughs> no, of course I agree. I mean, without assuming a low entropy initial state, there's no physics to be done, obviously. I mean, this is clear. So I believe the CMB was generated because the... Well, even if you assume a, a, a high entropy state, it's, it's not going to be... The fact that the entropy is going to increase, you know, if you assume a high entropy state, it's going to just stay high entropy. That's it. That's right. So... so. But we, that, that's the point, right? We observe that we're not in a maximal entropy state. That's a fact. So then we ask, what's our previous history? But our previous history is that it was, a, is a, it was an even lower entropy state. Always going to be that, or the same. Or the same. OK, but my point is the following. So uh, I agree that, uh, of course, I'm being provocative, obviously, right, uh, ultimately. But, but I do have a point at the end. I don't believe that it's an initial state that's just specified out of the box. But I do think this is more preferred over inflation. That's what I believe. So there, there's an alternative here to be found, which is what you call abracadabra. Why don't you take it to God created the universe a second ago? Let's discuss that question. Is it the same question? Why don't we discuss No, I don't have to postulate a creator. I'm just postulating initial yeah, conditions. Everything just started like from abracadabra. Abracadabra, yeah. Okay, 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 right, 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 that, 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 but that, that's, impor that's very important. No, no, that's a very important distinction. Very good, because that kind of logic would say it's much more probable that we just spontaneously created a second ago and all that. Okay, but I think there's a key difference. So I'm willing to, to tolerate the past hypothesis. I believe that the CMB, of course, didn't, you know, it's not just an illusion. We actually went through, I'm not crazy. Huh? No, because we have a theory of physics Right? It's the stuff we, we, we understand, photons and so forth. It was the same stuff back then. Nucleosynthesis, it was the same stuff back then. The part where I start to become skeptical is when we have to postulate the scalar field, something that we've never seen, some, some previous complicated history. Yeah. Why jump? Maybe one day we will know, but with that, I mean, why jump to abracadabra? Because at this current that point in time, you don't know very much. But, yeah. I mean, some people would have jumped in the creation of the Earth sometime ago. I don't know how it created. But you agree, abracadabra. but then, then I, you know, but you completely agree that uh, you need a theory of initial conditions to explain how inflation started. But the statement, the statement that people make that, oh, inflation, you can start with arbitrary initial conditions and inflation will start, yeah, I, that's, that's, that's crap. That's not true. However, yeah. the fact that, the fact that uh, when we observe something, usually in, the, in any historical science, the past is more unknown than the previous, you know, you get yeah. worse and worse, it's always. So yeah. this looks like more an extreme example because it's the current frontier, right? And of course. <laughs> you go continue. Now the current frontier, we don't know. What are, okay, the, the origin of life. How did life go? Let's start computing how probable it is. No, no, I, 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 I'm not disputing this. No, of but, course. Okay, I'm not going to not study the car. Okay, I have a car. Of course. Oh, the car doesn't exist. You know, at the end of the day. Of course, of course. And people have been, people they have been debating this, and yeah, Boltzmann. It's a waste of time to debate. Let's yeah. Just try to Okay, but the, so absolutely, I agree with you. Just the history of time, what happened, I believe, right, in the past, obviously. But the point that I don't accept is to say, oh, we've proven inflation. Well, based on what? Based on what? Based on a few observations? Based on a... Uh, there, there needs to be, I think we all agree, there needs to be a theory of initial conditions that makes somehow, that tells me quantitatively why the inflaton started out where it started in our past history. There has to be something. There had, there, there's equally an abracadabra 
here that tells me how I, out of quantum gravity I end up th in this history. Otherwise, I mean, I'm just, huh? I don't know how I started. I know about something about iron. I mean, dinosaurs, I observe them. I dig, I see bones. I see bones, right? I see bones, I see the cosmic microwave background, I, I, I measure it, I observe it, I see something. What do you see about inflation? What is it that you see? You see scale invariant perturbations. I'm not defending that. I'm defending okay. your jump to some sort of completely philosophical rapport. Of course. Uh, the fact that we now don't know something. I much rather you say we don't know it enough. I will, with the things that we might get, I don't think in my life that we would ever get it. I probably agree with this. So I'll go work on something else. That I, I have. Of course, but that's of course that's my message, right? That that the something else I think a more compelling if there is something else, would be some theory here, a dynamical theory, that would actually make this evolution entrop entropically favorable. Yeah, that's that, that would be nice, no? That, that, that's all I'm that's saying. Example. I have no problem. Of course, because, of course, that's the fun of being provocative, but... Uh, but that's the point, I think. I'm not, I'm not at all convinced that inflation occurred. That's it. Yeah. What is the difference, the fundamental difference between those two theories? In this sense, yeah. you have to postulate some stage before nucleosynthesis to make uh, the calculation for nucleosynthesis. Yeah. Now, the state is a thermal state. It looks very nice, and we believe nucleosynthesis occurred. Now, here, it's not so different. Also there, you have to specify initial conditions to make predictions. That's right. You specify reasonable initial conditions. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know. But I think to me the difference is that in the case of nucleosynthesis, I agree, we can make the same story. But there, it's all physics that we know. It's all, it's all, uh, it's all nu you know, nuclear physics. Hmm? Yeah, I, I think it's just a matter, I, I'm just saying, I'm not, you, you, all I'm saying is that it's not that I, I, I don't really believe in abracadabra initial state, okay? I'm being provocative. All I'm saying is that there's certainly room for a better alternative, which will make this, uh, which will generate the arrow of time. I mean, it, it is, it is, it is a logical possibility. Well, that will that will explain more naturally, let's say, how this how we started out in this particular state at the end of inflation. Anyways, that's it. I meant it to be provocative, okay, for fun. I knew. Yeah. So. Yeah, we stop. Okay. Thank you. Okay.